Hi, everyone. So just uh, for the sake of things, this meeting is being recorded. So um, we're recording this and we are live streaming on YouTube as well. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest, Professor Rosi Braidotti, and to welcome her to University College Cork, albeit virtually, on behalf of the Board of Women's Studies, the Center for Advanced Studies in Languages and Culture, and the Department of Applied Social Studies. Her work will be familiar uh, to most of you, but I will nonetheless give a short introduction before we start with the lecture, which will be followed by a conversation with Professor Nula Finnegan, Dr. Orlov Donovan, and Dr. Till Weingartner, and other members of staff at UCC, and attendees of this webinar can post their questions in the Q&A in the chat. So Professor Rosie Braidotti is a contemporary continental philosopher and feminist theorist. She's currently a distinguished university professor at Utrecht University, where she has taught since 1988, and where she also founded the program in women's studies, now the graduate gender program, as well as the Center for the Humanities. She has also been a powerful force in the Athena network or advanced thematic network in activities in women's studies in Europe, funded by the European Commission, which for 10 years in the 90s and 2000s has played a crucial role in the construction of programs, centers, and departments in women's studies and gender studies across Europe, influencing several generations of feminist scholars. Bredotti's publications, which are translated in over 20 languages, have consistently been placed in continental and feminist philosophy at the intersection with social and political theory, cultural politics, gender, and post-colonial studies. Her interdisciplinary work can be divided into three main focal points, contemporary subjectivity, feminist theories, and the posthuman convergence. The core of her work on subjectivity consists of four interconnected monographs with a special emphasis on the concept of difference within the history of European philosophy and political theory. These are patterns of dissonance from 1991, nomadic subjects from 1994, metamorphosis 2002, and transpositions 2006. Beridotti's philosophical project investigates how to think difference positively, which means moving beyond the dialectics of difference and sameness. She makes a case for an alternative view on subjectivity, ethics, and emancipation, and pitches diversity against the postmodernist risk of cultural relativism, while also standing against the tenets of liberal individualism. The second phase of Bredotti's research consists of a trilogy on the posthuman condition. The first volume is The Posthuman, Polity Press, 2013, which sets up the general framework for the convergence of advanced technologies on the one hand and advanced environmental devastation on the other. As the boundaries between the human and its others are becoming increasingly blurred through our digital lives, reproductive technologies, and genetically modified foods, the question of what it means to be human is taking a new turn. This also results in a need to reevaluate humanism and the humanities. Meridocti takes a closer look at these developments and proposes new and affirmative ways of producing knowledge and building communities. And these topics are further explored in Posthuman Knowledge 2019 and the forthcoming volume, Posthuman Feminism. Throughout her work, Braidotti asserts and demonstrates the importance of combining theoretical concerns with a serious commitment to producing socially and politically relevant scholarship that contributes to making a difference in the world. She has pioneered European perspectives in feminist philosophy and practice and has been influential on third wave and post-secular feminisms, as well as emerging post-humanist thought. All right, so without further ado, I will now give the floor to Rosie. We will discuss the, topics, uh, the topic of post-human ethics which is very much timely and needed in the current context, I believe. Over to you, Rosie, and thank you so much again for being with us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonfiglioli. Thank you, dear Chiara, and thank you all colleagues at Cork. And I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person and actually socialize a bit and chat more informally. These are very hard times and um, let's postpone into the future and make the most of this digitally mediated encounter. So uh, we decided to focus on posthuman ethics, topical, considering what's happening. And let me start by saying that I'm not particularly fond of anything that begins with post these days. Um, certainly, um, I didn't invent the term posthuman. Uh, I wish we could call it something else, and maybe we can discuss a little bit uh, about terminologies and cultural representations uh, in the Q&A session. But I take the posthuman not as a utopian, term, um, something that we're moving towards, I take it as an indicator of our historicity, as an indicator of where we are 
at. Uh, and where we are at is in a convergence phenomenon, um, a crossover phenomenon between contradictory trends that are putting all of us under tremendous stress. Um, on the one hand, very, very advanced technological developments and on the other hand, a very, very advanced um, environmental degradation. Um, uh, the fourth industrial revolution and the sixth extinction, not happening you know, on a alternate days or on a scheduled times, but happening concurrently. Um, and uh, the co-occurrence of, of totally contradictory phenomenon, um, phenomena is quite a, a sign of the times and as we're speaking now the perseverance um, uh, rover um, roaming around planet mars is sending uh, back the clearest images we have had of um, life in intergalactical spaces it's enough to make david bowie uh, sort of awake in her grave um, incredible technological advances um, uh, and here back on the old planet, a pandemic that is putting all of our lives at risk and showing so many problems um, and complications. This convergence, uh, I translate methodologically into the need to look more critically at the humanistic legacy of scientific rationalism that underscores the technological revolution on the one hand and look equally critically um, to the ingrained anthropocentrism of our ways of thinking, especially in the humanities and the social sciences. And this whole project that I never imagined would become so long and complicated started for me with a very simple question, what is the human in the humanities? And, and as a feminist working in the humanities most of my life, and, uh, of course, I had a distinct problem with that man of reason, that man of the humanities. Um, but that man is also anthropos, the representative of an ex absolutely uh, 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 violent and, and, and domineering species uh, that is putting the life of the planet at risk. It's the convergence, it's the crossover of those critical lines that causes a qualitative shift in the terms of reference. If you cross over anti-humanism or post-humanism with post-anthropocentrism, um, then the terms of the debate change and the human doesn't look the same again. And, and there is the problem here built in that I don't go into in the lecture to what an extent the critical traditions that we have become so fluent in, feminism, post and decolonial theories, push one line of critique, Eurocentrism, humanism, masculinism, um, but don't necessarily touch on the anthropomorphism, anthropocentrism issue. And on the other hand, a lot of um, animal rights work or um, non-human uh, rights as a scholarship does not necessarily touch on issue of racism and sexism. So there is an issue here about the recompartmentalization of the critical tools of the critical schools of thought that we need to look at. And in that sense, there is a meta-methodological um, angle to uh, the posthuman turn, but I just put that, annotate this and leave it there for the discussion because of what I, what I want to go on to is to look at how this pandemic, this moment that we're in is almost emblematic of the posthuman convergence. We have a human made disaster caused by undue interference in the ecological balance of the lives of multiple other species. And this pandemic caused by such ecological non-human violence um, has resulted in an increase in the use of technology. Just look at us today. Where would we be without our digital mediations? Um, everybody's working from home, those who have a home, uh, on their laptops, those who have a laptop. And the use of technology has become our reply to what is fundamentally an environmental and um, uh, post-anthropocentric um, public health emergency. So it, it, paradoxically, a, a technology-driven, capital-driven uh, pandemic is solved 
by more technology, more capital, more dependence on the same factors that caused the problem uh, in the first place. Welcome to the posthuman convergence, advanced technology, environmental degradation, crossing over, displacing, distressing and de delinking uh, connections that we'd become uh, accustomed to. There is a massive affect issue here and uh, times are uh, difficult. It's not even an, an understatement. Uh, the underlying mood of this pandemic is deeply affective. There is loss, there is mourning, um, there is discomfort. Um, uh, the, 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 there's, there's exhaustion, there's fear of the future, there's depressions. Um, we know what the statistics are saying about the situation of women and vulnerable people uh, in the homes, um, uh, transgender kids, um, uh, vulnerable categories. Um, uh, an epidemic doesn't cause social inequalities, it certainly reveals them, it brings them out. Um, and the first thing that, that strikes me in attempting to come to terms with the scale of the grief is we need to find the language, we need to find the right terminology and the right angle to do justice to the distress, to the grief, to the profound sense of mourning, and at the same time work together towards social horizons of hope. And that is where the ethical question is located for me. It's a question of affects and forces. I am a continental philosopher trained in the French tradition and ethics is not morality and ethics is not moral philosophy. Ethics is a discourse about power and forces. Morality is a discourse about norms and protocols. Of course, they intersect and hopefully they work together. But if you're looking at ethics, you're looking at interrelational forces. You're looking at how do we cope with this together? And who is the we that is constructing this utterance in the first place? So in saying we need a planetary posthuman ethics of human and non-human care, a care for the entire planet, posthuman ethic of general care, if you wish. And uh, it, that is a statement that involves critiques of power, involves the quest for a system of representation and appropriate language, uh, a, a kind of a post-postmodern interrogation, who is the we who is carrying the project, and a profound love for the world in the hope that we can together devise ways of coping with what has befallen us. So as I said, in looking at the posthuman phenomenon, taking the pandemic as our guiding uh, navigational tool, we see the interlocked nature of the ecologies that structure our existence. And a phenomenon such as COVID-19 is not just environmental, it is not just biomedical, it's not just about animals, it's about all of these um, issues. So we have multiple ecologies of belonging, environmental, social, a psychic, affective, emotional, um, and uh, complexity and multiplicities are the key issues here if we want to do justice to the phenomenon. And complexity and multiplicity have a difficult life these days. Um, you would have thought that with the coming of the massive information technologies, complexity and multiplicities would be part of the way that we work. But internet has turned out to be a simplification and bullying machines that prevents complexity rather than actually aiding it. Um, uh, the political climate that we're in, the deep anti-intellectualism of so many forms of populism of the right as well as on the left, um, seems that everything is mobilizing against complexity at a time when we need to keep the complex picture, the broader picture in mind. So multiple complex ecologies of belonging, we could cite endless sources, uh, I would say, uh, transnational feminism, ecofeminism, but also Guattari and Deleuze, you know, neo-materialist feminism, the interlocked nature of things. And we are made of the same meta. We, living entities, human and non-humans, are made of the same elemental particles. We could quote the laws of physics, we could quote Spinoza, we can quote um, multiple forms of material feminism, particularly the eco-feminist tradition, but to say we are variation on a common matter is to actually 
open a huge discussions about the limitations of social constructivism as the methodology that underscores so many of our analyses and what social constructivism assumes is the separation nature culture, the separation of sex and gender, the separation mind and body. And that separation is precisely that divide is what needs to be blown open. And we need to look at the interconnected nature of things. So posthumanism is neo-materialist and it is profoundly ecological, first remark. Second remark, the we in question, we humans is not a unitarian, um, total category. We are not uh, human in the same ways, not all humans are equal, uh, and the human is not a neutral category. It seems very banal, but it is important to stress because at a time of great crisis such as now, appeals to our common humanities, to you know, human rights, to we are in this together are very common, um, but we are actually not very much in this together. And we is not a unitary category and any appeals to the human tends to be discriminatory. There are entire categories of people who did not qualify as humans historically, women being one major one, but not only the LBGT categories at large do, do not belong to the elite group of the humans. Um, indigenous, um, decolonial, post-colonial categories of people are not fully humans. In fact, belonging to full humanity is quite a form of entitlement. Um, and by human, in fact, we mean a certain image of man, um, that man as masculine, white, Eurocentric, uh, heterosexual, able-bodied, urbanizing, speaking a standard language, owning the women and the children and the vast wealth of the earth. This man is a very specific image of the human. Um, and it is an image of the human that feminist and post-colonial and anti-racism people have been criticizing for decades. Um, it's the man of reason of, of, of Jenny Lloyd. Um, it is, it is the, the same of Lucy Rigore, is man one of Sylvia Winter. It's, it's that particular vision of the human which has simply seen its days um, um, and is now uh, exposed for the very particular provincial specific limited category that it is. Um, so exposing the power ridden assumptions behind that category of the human is the first uh, critical punch of the posthuman critique um, that, that we need to look at the limitations and look at how being human is postulated on a hierarchy of exclusions that creates less than human, dehumanized, non-human others. Um, as early as 2007, I think, Catherine McKinnon could write a book called Are Women Human on the basis of law and legal studies? Um, who qualifies as? So th th that, that takes care in a sense of the whole feminist critique of humanism as a limited category, knowing that we owe a lot to humanism at the same time as the philosophy that underscores equality and emancipatory programs. So it's always a balancing act. And to be critical doesn't mean that you completely expose and throw away the categories. You analyze carefully, you choose what we need to carry with us in the next phase, but you do not take them for granted. And you do not take human rights for granted without asking what is the notion of the human that you're applying here. And I would never accept an unmarked generalized definition of the human that flattens out all differences. Keep in mind also that the idea of a human as separate from uh, the natural, as separate from um, the environment is typical of the enlightenment contracts of um, European philosophy. Most cultures on earth do not separate nature from cultures. They pose a continuum across all species. Um, they have a distributed idea of humanity. The dualism of our tradition, the dualism, mind, body, nature, culture, human, non-human, uh, human one, human two, first sex, second sex, that way of thinking is specific 
of the European scientific mind. Uh, and it's something to do with the legacy of a certain idea of modernity and rational scientific use of technology that needs to be questioned. Um, and I think one of the exciting areas of in, in intersection in posthuman scholarship is the debate with indigenous epistemologies um, and non-Western philosophical systems which were dismissed in colonialism as animistic or pre-modern, uh, but, but which are based on a nature culture continuum on a human non-human continuum. I'm thinking of the work of Viviero de Castro, of, 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 of Bird Rose, of Tolbert, numbers of, of uh, indigenous scholars that are looking at different ways of conceptualizing the naturalness of the human, so to speak, pointing at ways out of the dichotomous ways of thinking that make us um, the culture of technology, the culture where we can have a posthuman convergence between technology on the one hand and the destruction of the planet on the other. Um, so thinking the interconnections and um, uh, thinking how we keep this balancing acts together is the great um, struggle. And I call this the, 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 the collective efforts of composing a we, a subject, um, that would be carrying the effort to think this multiplicity of um, both power relation and shifting connections. Um, uh, thinking something that hurts profoundly, that challenges habits of thought. So there is an effect here of disidentification, defamiliarization, getting out of your comfort zone. But there is also the simple pain of so much dying, of so much losses, um, so much suffering. And um, this is a broken planet. And that things calls it a damaged uh, planet. And, and it is our world, the only way, the only world we've got. So taking care of the pain of the world becomes one of the things that you do in critical theory. Um, and it is a profoundly post-secular uh, gesture, one that I certainly didn't learn in my philosophy classes where taking care of the world was about social justice and, you know, in a sense, straightforward sociological variables. What we've got here now is something else, much more embodied, embedded, and effective, relational, that challenges us at multiple levels. I think that the affective turn and the, uh, all the emphasis on affect is terribly important here, um, because it is through affect that we apprehend uh, the, 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 the pain of the world and the potential uh, for um, uh, regeneration of the same world, which takes me gently into the question of what kind of ethics I would have in mind um, to, to deal with these multiple layerings. I said we, we apprehend uh, the pain of the world, the complications of the world, the power relations of the world through affect. And in the beginning, affect. That is my neo-materialist, neo-spinozist moment. And uh, affect is not emotions. Affect is the structure that allows you to have emotions. Um, it is, it is a, a constitutive component of um, being human, in fact, of being alive. Um, all that lives um, is a relational entity, uh, networking with multiple forces around it, air, water, others, social rules, um, technologies, constant negotiations. Um, Affect is our ability to relate to and be related to by others. I think the 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 actually the the, the branch of scholarship that gets the affect turn uh, right is uh, the soft edge of the neurosciences. Um, it is uh, Damasio uh, in in looking for Spinoza. Uh, it is. Um, Andy Clark with the, the idea of distributed consciousness um, that we perceive um, the world even before we comprehend it. And in some ways, we only really know what we love and do relate to. So affect is a structural component, not a psychological frame of mind. That is very important because it brings in immediately relationality. And with relationality, we bring in sociality, the social, others, multiple others with whom we construct 
affective structures that allow us to come to terms with the complexity of the times. And what the ethical enterprise is in this frame of mind is the collective endeavor to develop frames of understanding of complexities that actually, in our case, hurt. Um, now, if you're a feminist, post-colonial uh, race person, you've been dealing with painful subjects all your life. So in some ways, those, those of us who have been in this, in this line of business, we are specialists at extracting knowledge from pain. That's what we do. Um, extracting knowledge from pain is the politics of experience. It's the politics of location, the radical imminence of a feminist approach where you learn from the dispossessed, from the marginalized, from the excluded, and you treat the experience of marginalization and exclusion as a training course. It gives you basic fundamental information about the workings of the world. So for some of us, that's what we do and we should be valorized a lot more and rewarded a lot more for the hard work that we do. For the average person, this is not, a familiar situation. Um, the idea that you take on and you process the pain of the world is not exactly how social theory is usually uh, presented. So the affective turn assumes that we agree as a community to function in this way, that together we need to process the pain and the complications and the complexities of the times to construct affirmative answers. Again, we are not in psychology, we are in philosophies of <coughs> interrelation, whereby what is affirmative is not silly optimism. Silly optimism is the ideology of consumeristic capitalism. And it continues even through the pandemic. <laughs> it's the ideology of shopping. It's the ideology of Gwyneth Paltrow, buy well-being, buy wellness and be happy. And, um, that shallow optimism that conceals the devastating effects of neoliberal austerity measures, of neoliberal inequalities. Um, it's the cruel optimism of, of Berlin. Affirmation is the opposite of us. Affirmation is a, a qualitative exercise in working together to increase our ability to take on and process the, the, the knowledge and the pain of the world. It's an increase in our relational capacity, an increase in our energy, in our ability to understand and to come to terms and by understanding adequately and coming to terms with the complexity, we increase our ability to act into the world. And affirm affirmation is what increases your capacity to act and negativity um, is what decreases it. Um, joy and sadness, love and hatred. Spinoza does wonderful things with this and Jenny Lloyd, and Maura Gatins in their feminist work on Spinoza showed the importance of these geometrical forces. A, an affirmative, joyful ethics opens you up into the world. A negative one shuts you down and breeds impotence, breeds resentment, breeds a sense of the impossible, and ultimately um, uh, makes you uh, loathe yourself and your own inability to act. I think that sense of powerlessness is enormous at the moment. We see it in our students, we see it in ourselves, the sense that the horizon is shut and nothing is possible. I started reading more of Spinoza with feminism, with indigenous writing. If you look at Viviero de Castro, the things he does with Deleuze and Spinoza, Deleuze is just a neo-Spinozist at heart. Uh, if you look at all of that, you see the efforts to think, how do we see the light at the end of the, of the tunnel? And Spinoza lived through horrendous times. He lived through a major political crisis, the end of the Dutch Republic. He lived through a, in very difficult times and he writes the ethics in the middle of all of this as almost a logistical treaty on how to construct collectively horizon of hope as a relational increase, as a way of enlarging our ability uh, to act and to take on the world. So the, the, the affirmative ethics is an increase, an opening out and then devising together ways of dealing with this 
together. Um, that togetherness, which is not a universal sweep that deletes all differences, <clears throat> but a relational bond that connects that makes us agree about the terms upon which we need to intervene, multi-level, multi-dimensional, multi-directional. Uh, we are looking at rhizomic, non-linear systems here, whereby if we're trying to come to terms with the pandemic and what the world will look like, the famous post-COVID world, what that would look like, you're looking at interlocking ecologies, there are social economic issues, there are biogenetic issues, there are geopolitical issues, there are moral issues, there are uh, affective issues. It's, we can all intervene at the level of our expertise, but what is crucial is that we keep a framework within which we can make sense of what we are doing, an effective frame, an affirmative frame of acting into the world um, and getting on with it. So it's a series of paradoxes, but on the one hand, we're saying we displace the centrality of Anthropos. It's, it's post-anthropocentric. We accept that we are part of a sequence. The, the jargon term is a heterogeneous assemblage. Humans are partly non-human. We are technologically mediated. Look at us. Um, we are dependent on clean air and clean water and on a number of, of, of medical and other support system. There are webs, interlocking webs of relation that make us able to function. So we have a kind of a pluralization of the self and yet an emphasis on um, how this pluralized, open, distributed nomadic self has to cooperate with others to produce as a political praxis, affirmative options, horizons of actions. Um, and there's multiple discussion in this and the most standard critique of this is saying, yeah, affirmation, affirmation, but what about the pain? So let me repeat again, affirmation is not facile optimism. Affirmation is the job of extracting knowledge and information from pain, process it collectively in order to produce multi-scalar, multi-level responses, alternatives, so that we can act in the world, so that we can break out of the sense of fragmentation, isolation, powerlessness. I'm working here on the assumption, quoting again Deleuze, that one of the definition of contemporary fascism is the sadness of the soul, the sense of utter powerlessness, complete impotence. We cannot act. There's nothing that we can do. We are trapped. That sense that we are trapped, that there is nothing that we can do, that we cannot break out. That desperation, I think, is um, what affirmative ethics takes on as a, pr a collective praxis to transform this into the possibility for acting together towards um, uh, uh, horizons that we can define um, and describe and, 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 and sustain together. There's a, a key term here is the transversality of these connections. These are transversal uh, cutting across um, um, ways of functioning. We need alliances, in other words, um, with all kinds of sectors of activities. In academia, it would be intense transdisciplinarity. We need to look at the environment. We need to look at the technology. We look at, look at public health, socioeconomic issues, race issues, sexism issues, the transphobia issue. There's a set of things that we need to be looking at. And that transdisciplinarity, you see again, and the meta-methodological angle coming up is really a headache in academia where methods have, have their own genealogy, history, institutional place to say we need to go transdisciplinary causes the greatest disarray. And this is why the second volume in my work on the panhuman is about the new humanity, the post-humanities, um, environmental humanities, digital humanities, um, health or medical humanities, um, which are completely transversal exercises, usually um, contained in a very different institutional frame from the classical humanities. And um, environmental studies institute or digital uh, humanities institutes are usually 
a third party. They're, they're not always inside the old faculties. In fact, there is a real, I think, distance between the classical humanities and the post-humanities, which are very transversal and are also very corporate and also involve uh, the arts practices. Um, almost every environmental humanities institute has a writer in residence and a filmmaker in residence, very transversal, very trans. Uh, the future is trans and the university is not so uh, mobile. It's not so transversal. So there is a really crucial issue. How do we practice this transversality and how do we think it? A number of people that I work with in Don de Pistuman have looked at this pandemic as a great opportunity to rethink transversality as an axis of affirmation. Um, I'm thinking of the work of Hartman, Adamson, uh, guard, <clears throat> sort of people who come from the environmental humanities uh, and that they have crossed over the environmental humanities with issues of sex and gender and race and decoloniality. Um, and they are looking at these heterogeneous assemblages, the we, the subject that carries these exercises, saying we need an ethics that respects the hybridity and the diversity and yet acts together towards um, creating a better world out of this COVID uh, moment. COVID is, is, is something that exposes a great deal of the power issues and many of us had been argued for for decades. It exposes the limitations of neoliberal economics. It's a great opportunity um, if we turn it in the right directions. Um, uh, now, instead of staying just with the biopolitical analysis of this, uh, that always puts you know, the interest of humans and anthropos at the center, can we imagine, uh, argue, environmental humanities crossed over into feminism, uh, post-colonialism, decolonialism, race issue, etc. Can we think of a new mode of relation? And they've invented the term syndemic, not pandemic, but syndemic um, uh, to deal with the challenge of this virus. Um, um, a virus that lives in us and with us, like many other viruses before, a virus which is not an alien other that we can exterminate in the military mode that is so typical of biopolitical thinking. Um, it, it is not uh, a, an alien other external to our ecologies of belonging that we can hope to destroy. Um, it, is, it is an element of our multiple environments that we need to live with, that we need to, to make friends with, that we need to actually find ways of cooperating with. It's not going to go away. It will continue mutating because this is what viruses do. Footnote, both Michel Serre and Gilles Deleuze had been working on parasites and viruses as indicators of the difficulties for the humanities, for philosophers, for critical theory to get out of anthropocentrism and how difficult it is to imagine that actually we are in this together with alien elements um, uh, that are actually quite negative and quite, um, uh, quite destructive and syndemic and describes the many interlocking ways in which um, we can learn to live with um, this disaster and learn from it. Um, I think to see connections between public health, social class, racism, climate change, uh, police violence, discrimination against women and the BGTs and indigenous uh, knowledge system that we have neglected, to see the relational interconnection and to turn it into um, a source of knowledge information that we can activate. Now, the, 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 the quarrel here would be with the more military binary way to look at the biopolitical. I'm thinking of the work of Esposito, of the work of Agamben, where the virus is the enemy to be exterminated. There is a real military binary logic here. Now, if we take an, a, a posthuman ethics of affirmation, there is no dualism. There is not this dialectical anti antagonism. There is interrelationality, interconnection, a humble acceptance of the interdependence between human and environmental factors and hard work needed to devise multiple ways in which the syndemic 
can teach us how to live and inhabit this planet and our society differently. So an adequate response to the crisis and a posthuman ethical response to the crisis is to learn to think in complexity with complexity, to devise synergetic ways to make sense of the situation and devise together uh, possible horizons um, uh, of, of social hope. What is being affirmed in affirmation is not shallow optimism. What is being affirmed is the conviction that what makes us human in the posthuman mode, as it did before in some ways, is the ability to generate the conditions for our own renewal. Uh, the, the human is the animal that reinvents itself um, in radical imminence, hopefully with a minimum amount of humility towards the environmental forces on which our survival depends, with pride for our technology, but great criticism for the hubris with which technology disregards the environmental tolls that it is taking. Think of the Bitcoin technology. Everybody's greeting Bitcoin cryptocurrencies. We know the amount of energy that the calculation of Bitcoins are taking. Uh, one of the computational rounds of Bitcoin technology <laughs> uses as much um, electricity as the entire state of Iceland for a year. So lovely technology, but can we really afford it? Posthuman convergence thinking, cross things over. Learn to honor the multiple ecologies that we belong to critically, but creatively. And there's a long history to this, there's stoicism, there's multiple other tradition, but what the posthuman turn attempts to do is to give us that extra punch of energy, saying not only stupidly we can do it, like Nike says that we can do it, but zooming in on that irrepressible, inexhaustible capacity to think the future. That is what makes us human, posthuman, but really posthuman, all too human, would be my conclusion. Thank you so much, Rosie. Uh, this was fantastic. Uh, I think our panelists can now be back and there will be some questions uh, starting, uh, I think, um, who's starting, I think Professor Nola Finnegan uh, was starting and then Orla or the other way around. Um, sorry, Chiara, I, I, um, Orla's going to start and then yeah. I'll follow on from that, okay? Perfect, yeah. So Dr. Orla Donovan from Applied Social Studies at UCC will ask the first question to you, Rosie. Hey, um, well, hello everybody. And um, thank you, Rosie, so much for this extremely rich, challenging, but also um, hopeful talk. Um, and for your insistence on um, radically different understandings of the, you know, the, the words ethical, affect, um, affirmation, and also for sharing this, this um, this term of a, a syndemic with us. Um, I think we could possibly spend the rest of the time discussing this and the idea yeah. of um, having to become, you know, learning to live with virus, the, the virus, or maybe even making kin with it. Um, my only regret is that we um that we're we can't you can't be with us um or we can't all be together in, in person, but as you say, such as the what such, a paradox. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. I should say at the outset that unlike some other members of the panel, I'm a relatively I'm a relative newcomer to to your work and to um, to the new to new materialism to the effective and and posthuman turn. Um, as I'm, I'm I'm coming from a field of um, social studies where these continue to be new. Um, <laughs> And my, my first exposure to your work was, um, came via Margaret Schildrich a few years ago. Mm -hmm. She was working with us on a project called Living Well with the Dead in Contemporary Ireland. Um, and she impressed upon us the, the significance of your work and, the, uh, and of the questions you're asking, uh, especially this question of, you know, what, what is the, the, the human? Um, but since then, I've been, I've been reading your work, um, including with, uh, with students, and a group of those students are with us now the, this afternoon, um, a group who've been reading the, the posthuman um, glossary. 
Um, and again, just listening to you, I was, uh, I was thinking that the, it is a transversal class. So this is where we have students from. It's it's a it's a quite a, an in, you know a cross disciplinary gathering of students, including people who are working as public health dentists who are training us in dentistry to students of of, of philosophy. Um, so um, yeah, so thanks to Margaret Childrick for for that. Um, I'd like to begin the um, this this panel discussion, Rosie, um, by asking you to speak about the urgency and importance that you have attached to experimentation, even even in the creation of new words, experimenting with with new words like the like the the syndemic, um, but also. Um, I suppose experiments in you know what we what we are capable of becoming, um, and you you describe the posthuman as a field of transdisciplinary transdisciplinary maybe even postdisciplinary um, experimentation. So I'd really like to ask you to speak more about that headache that you you referred to, you know where you've 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 spoken about the importance of this experimenting of new ways of speaking speaking, thinking, publishing, zigzag thinking, non-linearity. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk about the, the headaches um, that go with that um, kind of commitment to transdisciplinary experimentation, particularly when we're talking about, you know, in the, if we're talking about with amongst people who are working in universities that are increasingly neoliberalized, um, in a, an environment, as you say, that's um, a broader environment that's increasingly anti-intellectual. Um, so if you could talk about those headaches, but also if you could point us towards some um, experiments that inspire you and that might inspire us too, please. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, complex question. So um, uh, who is chairing? Are you chairing, Chiara? Yeah, I will be chairing. Can you keep an eye on me because that yeah. I don't go off like the... Fidel Castro critical theory and talk for six hours. No worries. So can you contain me uh, by coming back and say cut? Um, because these are really um, rich and complex questions. So I don't want to get overboard. Thank you very much. So um, experimentation, crucial. Uh, several reasons why um, it is. Um, coming from feminism, uh, women's studies, gender studies, uh, at the source, of my whole itinerary is critical distance from the tradition that I belong to. Mm. Um, disidentification from the very disciplines. Now, if you come from philosophy, it's not difficult because it's such a woman unfriendly discipline that it pushes you away anyway. So by, by being kicked on the margins, you learn um, a few things. And, and um, I think if you look at the relationship between feminist and philosophy throughout time, um, um, it's one of the most hostile um, disciplines. So it's built into the system that you think, okay, I can't think like they do, but it is my tradition. I find philosophy an incredible corpus of text. I mean, I, on my desert island, there would be you know, philosophy books. It would not be novels. I just love them. But within that discipline, in the critique of the sexism, phalarogocentrism, whatever we want to call it, the, the quest for new terminology alternative methodologies, other ways of thinking is coextensive with the feminist gesture. Um, and, and feminism is often criticized for being jargonized as if other disciplines were not. But I think what we are doing is literally inventing new terms as we go, because there are none to represent our experiences. We go back to the, 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 the radical empiricism of a tradition that extracts knowledge from pain or from the awareness of exclusion. And, and there you need to map uncharted territories. And, and then it's a struggle, a constant struggle with, with language. So there is the critical element um, of that, but there is also the creative part. Uh, for one thing, you trust experience and the radical empiricism, the lived experience, the politics of location. I know what I know because I know, because I've been there. And so have so many of us that we can verify collectively as, a data of experience um, and that collective extraction of knowledge and gives you a, a creative a punchline. I see feminist theory as a field that has accelerated incredibly. I mean, if you look at, at, at Kate Millett's PhD, 
1968, and Kate Millett's PhD was sexual politics. And in that PhD, Kate Millett could summarize the entire knowledge we had about women in 1968. She does every single discipline in the humanities. She could cover the full bibliography for every discipline in the humanities. 1968, you couldn't even do one discipline today. So enormous has been the production of knowledge. If you could just step back for one moment and look at what has been produced, extraordinary, extraordinary. Over 40, 50 years, unimaginable, the creativity of that. And I came upon the posthuman in my work of surveying what is happening in my fields um, uh, in terms of feminist knowledge. So radical empiricism, trusting what is being produced means that you go out and survey the field that it was about uh, 12, 15 years ago, I started seeing human, non-human, posthuman emerging. You see it emerging and popping up everywhere. I thought, what exactly is going on? So you could say that my trust in the knowledge produced by the field made me spot what Foucault would call the emerging fields um, that I then said critical posthumanism to differentiate it from dominant posthumanism, which would be the ethos of capitalism, about which I hope we can talk, transhumanism being one, and trusting what I was seeing, saying this is telling us something about the present. And this is how I want to ans finish my answer, trusting the present, trusting what you think is happening to us through the emergent fields of knowledge, through a trust in the experience that we share with others uh, of marginalization, exclusion, the never ending process of trying to reach equality is trusting the present. Now, annotation. In the humanities, we are not encouraged to trust the present. The humanities are devoted to the past. The humanities is a field of study that venerates its own history. You study literature, it's the history of literature. Um, you study art, it's the history of art. You study music, it's the history of music. It's always the history of, we're devoted to the past um, in a way that even the social sciences are not. And that's a huge problem if you're trying to come to terms with the present. Until recently, you couldn't even write a PhD about a living author. Uh, being dead was a prerequisite for being written about. Why is that? Well, several reasons, but coming to terms with the present is of the greatest importance if you're doing critical theory. If you're trying to understand what COVID-19 is doing to a collectivity, to a community, in this case, almost to a species. So uh, present, dealing with the contemporary, what does it mean? And I do that with uh, applying one of Deleuze's great insights, which he gets from Bergson, about the multi-directional nature of the present. Not only is it a continuum, present, past, future, fine, but it is also looking in all directions at once. And I approach the present as tracking what we are ceasing to be. We are no longer human in the way that we were before feminism and decolonial theory and race theory. We understand things about the human. Now, that, that man is dead. Of course, said it in, in 68, but that, that man of the human has been dead for a while. It doesn't prevent him from being active, but it's over really. So we are ceasing to be certain things but we're also in the process of becoming something else. So it is both potestas and potentia. It's negative, but also affirmative. And where I try to put my emphasis with the ethics project is what are we capable of becoming? What could we do with this? Because it is simultaneously actual and the virtual. This is the most anti-Hegelian moment in the entire philosophical framework. Um, of, of neo spinozis when we are looking, what is negative doesn't disappear from history. It goes quietly to sleep and waits exactly like a virus and waits, waits for its chance to re-emerge. Now our task collectively is to ignite actual po virtual possibilities and actualize them. Now that is a gesture of creativity. So experimentation, yes, role of art, music, all the artistic practices, activism, corporate experiments. And, uh, I mean, the entire Silicon Valley is about trying things out, breaking things, moving fast. Everybody's experimenting except the university in our fields. No experimentation possible, rigidity, 
uh, quantification uh, worship of the past. Um, all you need to do is go and talk to our friends in medicine or in veterinary science to see how they experiment. Um, uh, but there is a strange, cruel, almost sadistic veto on experiment experimental thinking in the humanities, which is part of our crisis. And here we could talk for six hours, but my boss has appeared on the screen. So it's my time to zip up. I hope that gives you a sense of the answer. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe if I could just ask you one more question, continuing that um, um, discussion of your, your commitment to experimentation, that I've, I've read where you're, um, in terms of the, I suppose, the, the, this um, increasing attack on the on the humanities and sense that they're irrelevant, etc. That um, you've made a, a a case saying that um, well for posthuman scholars that they need to be more actively involved in policy making okay. and they need to take assume the role of policy advisors. And I'm just wondering if there are tensions between, on the one hand, experimenting with new ways of thinking and talking, and then trying to engage with people in the policy making realm. It's very complicated. It's absolutely true that um, being in, engaged, involved in, in the discussion is important. And uh, all of us coming from the radical epistemologies, we don't often get invited to sit around the table. Uh, so we have to kind of push for the invitations. But I've been, I haven't talked about, about my practice. There's a lot of practice, but uh, not for now. One of the projects I've done recently is a European project on the new humanities uh, funded by the Volkswagen Foundation in Germany. Germany is a country that, that really supports the humanities. And we're finding out extremely interesting data about how widespread the post-humanities are. There's almost no university in Europe that does not have a digital humanities and an envir environmental humanities, and now a medical humanities, humanities institute, program, mm. uh, degrees, but nobody ever invited the humanities to discuss um, what exactly would be the case. Mm. In fact, most of the new humanities, post-humanities, hardly have any humanists. Um, uh, there will be, uh, what is permanent is the bioethics. There is a kind of a seat at the, ta at the table for ethics by which they mean moral philosophy, Kantian universalism. Uh, Martha Nussbaum, brilliant thinker, but very, very much in at the core of the, of the humanist culture. Um, they have a seat at the table, but for the rest. Um, to, so one of the things that intrigues me is why do these new transversal uh, configuration of knowledge, why do they call themselves humanities? Um, uh, except that they are redefining the human very, very actively. Uh, and they are loaded with money because all of them carry a very strong corporate section, the digital, all of the, the IT, the, the, the medical. I mean, how much money do these people make? Just the vaccine. Um, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So there is a, the capital is going in that direction. And, and one of the things that, that, that I think one of the punchlines of my critical posthumanism is, is look what is happening to the field. And then, and then at that point, uh, it, it gets very complicated in the sense that a lot of the, of, the, of the, in the sense that we need to share the reading. We need to share the character. Do we agree that this is what is happening to us? That that is the issue here with the readings of the present. I do a lot with the notion of cartography which is that is my account of what is happening. Do we agree? Because if we don't agree, it's the end of the conversation. What I find in a lot of humanities um, faculties, certainly in the Netherlands is, no, we don't agree that this is the case. We have the environmental humanities, but it's not the real humanities. We are the real humanities, but so, and they do other things, but very equivocal, very messy discussions. Um, but the, the line of defense would be the traditional humanity versus these other humanities. What is also problematic for me is the relative silence of gender studies, post-colonial studies, race studies on this very issue, i.e. a recompartmentalization of knowledge whereby the medical humanities, the environmental humanities, the digital humanities do not include gender, post-colonial and race theory. Absolutely not. We are staying behind in the old configuration of power doing essentially anthropocentric research. Now, that's the other danger of this. I'm not the only one saying this. I'm thinking of Chakabarti famous essay on the long time of history. Uh, it's already five, six years ago that he wrote a famous Anthropocene and history essay saying, if we don't hurry up, a great deal of the critical tradition will be irrelevant 
because guess what? The Anthropocene is coming and man is not at the center. The human is not at the center anymore. And I think hearing that message was for me a very, very important wake up call. Yes, we need to activate ourselves taking different positions. You don't have to be Foucaultian, Deleuzean. You can love humanism, I don't care. We don't have to agree on all parameters, but on a shift of perspective, I think, urgently. Uh, we need to be very, very active and be in there and bring our critical tradition with us in this new configuration of power. But you can see the methodology. Do we agree to, do we have an adequate understanding of the situation that we can share? So we have the cartography, we have the relationality, we have the affectivity. That's already a couple of seminars to sort that one out. Yeah. And on the basis of that, we would be able to make policies. But that's for me, the humanities in the 21st century, this type of process. Yeah, the headaches. Hi, boss. Thank you so much, Rosie. I'll, I'll, maybe we can come back to some of this in a little while, but I think we move on to, to Nula. The chair has reappeared thunderously <laughs> on the horizon. <laughs> Thank you. Chiara has appeared rather menacingly, so we know it's, yeah, it's time yeah. to move on. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I want to thank you so much, um, Rosie, for energizing us so much this afternoon. I, I, I'm sure I speak for everybody in the audience when I say that. Um, and I, I also speak as someone who's been reading your work for, for a long time, and I'm laughing at your, uh, ca your um, categorization of the humanities as obsessed with the past. Um, I, I am a struggling scholar in the humanities, and I do struggle with the present. So um, um, I, I feel that most acutely um, in, in my own field of story, which is, you know, broadly speaking, Hispanism or looking at, at, at Mexico and, and current contemporary realities there. And I wanted to ask you maybe maybe two questions and, and they are they are connected and I'm, I'm conscious that there are many other people in the audience who also want to um, to speak with you. So I, I don't want these to be extended. But the first one is is, is around the, the joyfulness of your work. And I'm thinking back to nomadic subjects and I was tremendously influenced by that as a way of imagining a subject in the process of becoming and, and a feminist subjectivity that, that could be non-linear and that could uh, be interrelational and, and all of these beautiful ideas that you bring together in that work. And I suppose I sometimes have trouble squaring that, that joyful, uh, you, you might call it even a utopian impulse, which I revel in and, and I, 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 I love to read with the stories of pain and the stories of exclusion that we are studying. And my, my the recent focus of my work has been on femicide and there are no sadder kind of stories of, of, of extreme pain and, and violence than, than stories about femicidal violence done to women's bodies. So that's my first question is about how you, you square that joyfulness with the radical exclusion and the radical pain. Um, and my second question is about the compartmentalization of critical tools that you've touched on in your talk. Um, and I think I understand from you that your answer to that is transversality. It's about transdisciplinarity. And I guess the, the million dollar question about that is how, how do we do that in the academy? Is it about a, a radical reconfiguration of disciplines as we know it? Or is it about just adding bits like the environmental humanities, digital humanities, and, and hoping that at some point we all start to speak to each other. So there are my two questions and uh, I, I'd love to hear your responses Thank to them. You Thank so you so much. Difficult, wonderful, and complex. Um, um, so let's see if I can organize this. The, first of all, the, the fields of application or the posthuman are so many and moving so fast that one gets energized just looking at them. We mentioned Margaret Sheldrick before, but the whole field of what used to be disability studies and medical studies, completely up and running. And uh, bodies otherwise configured saying, are you talking about human enhancement? Look at me, I'm enhanced. I can do things that you can't even begin to do. Uh, I can move my, my one arm in ways that you can't even um, begin with your two. So the idea that uh, disability studies going beyond advocacy to a real claim of radical difference. Um, the whole field of pedagogy, uh, like teaching, and how do we teach with, of course, now computers, but how do we teach with non-human elements of all kinds? How do we teach the nature culture continuum and all the field of men? So, the speed with which this field is developing. I mean, even the first book was 13 and Carrie Wolf, 
I think, coins the terms post-humanities in, in 2010 and with, the, with the book series. If you look at what is happening, the speed, how it resonates with people, it's like you are lifting a burden off the shoulder saying, you know, we don't have to work with humanism and anthropocentrism. We can throw them out and work with continuity. And people go, oh, at last, what a relief. I can begin to be you know, in my world. So thinking with the world symbiotically, and not against it. So all of this to say that if we agree that thinking with the present, taking the risk of the present, working collectively, adequate knowledge, cartographies of the present, uh, deploying our critical skills to find modes of intervention, that is how you generate joy. It's an energy exercising, uh, energy producing exercise. And, and Spinoza is very strong on this, um, that it is always collective practice to make it possible to intervene uh, in the world. This is why Spinoza is a radical de uh, democracy thinker. He's completely against Locke and, and Hume and, and the social contract. So we don't need a social contract. We need the people getting together, sorting it out. And this is why a certain reading of Spinoza is so important for people like Tony Negri and radical democracy people. And this is a radical democracy person working in the 17th century. You know, as the entire system goes into the social contract, which we all know is the prelude uh, to the modern organization of the family and to colonialism. That, that's what it is. It's, it's launching uh, the white man's burden on a planetary scale. And the Spinoza saying, I don't think so. <laughs> and nobody really listening to it. Most interesting um, as a case. So you generate that joyfulness. It is, um, I think Lynn Siegel gets it a little bit in her book on happiness and um, the happiness of people who've been in demonstrations together and what you're saying is no what you're saying is i'm against but it is an opposition that is not dialectically antagonistic murderous and certainly not the feminist ones it's the no of affirming the possibility of alternatives it's, it's the no that Deleuze renders as i would prefer not to I would prefer not to. And, and that is actually expressing a desire. It's expressing a preference, but as a no. So that joyfulness <coughs> is connected to a number of con uh, conceptual shifts. Um, uh, the, the, the continuum, the relational, <coughs> in the beginning, the relation. And it is desire as production and uh, the desire to act as something that we produce together. And this notion of desire as production is the critique of desire as lack. What we have behind this is Hegel versus Spinoza. Desire as lack, you desire what you don't have, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And so desire is a corrida. It's, it's, it's like a, a struggle. Think, think Jessica Benjamin, uh, the bonds of love. Who gives in first? Um, the philosophy of love in our culture. Um, who rapes and who gets raped? Um, it's, it's, it's a murderous power game. It's, it's desire as lack. Desire as um, uh, be my body, be my corpse. Um, uh, you know, uh, vita, vita tu amors mea, my life uh, for your death, your death for my life. It's, 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 it's violent. Um, in opposition to this, and this really does come with a, with a turn to Spinoza in the 1970s and breaks out really with um, uh, Serre, with Deleuze, um, early Rigore, although she's a bit ambivalent on Spinoza, desire as plenitude desire as overflowing, overflowing what? In the ability to relate. We are affective beings. What we are is we are affected by others. We affect others. In the exchange, we replenish, we negotiate, we resonate and we are alive. And that, that you, you can do this with Lynn Margulis with the symbiotic elements. We recharge with our bacteria, our viruses. You know, it's constant interchanges. Um, uh, Donna Haraway takes it also in the symbiotic um, uh, mode um, in her latest book that we live with, we become with. What a relief to be out of the black box of the molecular individualized um, self. Um, but that depends on how you feel about uh, liberal individualism. For me, it's a relief to be out of it. So it's a process, it's a production, and it's something that we can cultivate. Um, desire as plenitude, desire as overflowing, 
desire as having what you don't have and you don't even know that you have. But you know, we are very good at giving what we don't even know that we have. We, the marginal of the earth, that's all we ever do. The magical trick of pulling up more love, more energy. Um, uh, and, and, and it is a continually fulfilling. Um, so to, this is vital materialism uh, minus the organicism of the 20th century to cut a long, long, long story short. Um, <laughs> but it replenishes you as, as you go. And this is what you find in the exchanges between these relational philosophies in Europe uh, Spinoza would be one, Leibniz would be another, Whitehead, Deleuze, and indigenous philosophies. I'm thinking Vivero de Castro, Descola, White, um, again, Rose, uh, where you have the, the, there is the indigenous vitalism, say we're part of nature. Um, the weather has an impact on your psyche, guess what? Uh, and, 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 and take it seriously. Um, uh, so learning a different cosmology here is I think a very crucial part of decolonizing uh, the curriculum of posthuman humanities. And, uh, and there's a lot to be learned here. Um, leaps of the imagination here, uh, the energy, think Afrofuturism. Think what it takes to be Octavia Butler when you're looking at slavery and you're doing space travel. Now what goes on in there? What a leap that is. People say escape, escapism. No, I'd say affirmation. You're overturning an experience into a possibility, into a portal for multiple futures. And all the feminist utopias, and, and I think one of the science fiction, we have, we have a long, long history of this in our culture. Um, the, you're taking a situation, you're actually turning it around. What it takes, what it takes, a lot of energy, it takes a lot of confidence, it takes a lot of love, a lot of trust. And here the philosophy that has been popping up in our tradition is old stoicism, not in the model of Wall Street and Silicon Valley that always take everything and turn it into a disaster. But classical stoicism where you're saying pain is a training school. Pain teaches you things. Cultivate pain and have a little bit of pain every day. Take doses of it so that you can train yourself to face the ultimate challenge. Thou shalt die. Live every day of your life as a preparation for dying. The most cheerful affirmative philosophy, make friends with that. Guess what? Um, you're not the center of the universe, or as we say in Australia, get a life. And, and get a life has become my motto for you know, learn to live with this step by step. Stoicism at the moment in full swing, as opposed to the more grandiose metaphysical philosophies of life that we have had. Unfortunately, Wall Street has caught hold of it and they have the corporate version, which is suffering is good for you, suffer some more. That's not what I mean by yeah. <laughs> Quickly on compartmentalization um, and how to cope. Uh, complicated, um, I've written a long essay in theory, culture and society on this. And then I couldn't even put it into a book because it is a little bit too risky over the accelerationism. No. Capitalism moves really, really fast. Um, uh, cognitive capitalism, because it is us, because it is about the production of knowledge, because we are imminent to the conditions that we are critical of, which is uh, immanence 101. We are not external to this. We're not transcendent to capitalism just because we are against it. We are against it, but we're right in it. Look at the technology that we're using. So if we are part of the problem, we need to be part of the solution to the problem. But the accelerations are extraordinary. And um, I mean, I continue to be obsessed by the Perseverance rover on Mars because I learned that 80% of space industry um, exploration is private and it is funded by the, the, the tech, essentially Bezos and Musk are, are, have contracts from NASA to mine outer space. Trump passed a law allowing mining in outer space and Biden has just confirmed that law. It's the only law by, by Trump that he has just confirmed. So we're going to be mining outer space. As we speak, the acceleration is this, this much, this fast. And we are still on earth trying to debate whether we should go behind the human. 
Okay, so you're looking at speeds and acceleration. What we need to look at here is a serious seminar on how advanced capitalism works. And, and I would absolutely go with a thousand plateaus of the Les Guattari speeds and flows. And they're moving very, very fast. And the emergence of the post-humanities is for me a form of epistemic accelerationism. All of a sudden they were there. I repeat, we were not, I don't remember being called by anybody at a meeting saying, shall we do the environmental humanity? No, it was there top down with a very hefty budget, with staff selected across the university, with sponsorship from the corporate world, that uh, all done, all in place. Um, um, and I don't want to be paranoid, but the pattern has now come up over and over again. It may be changing now, but... <clears throat> With this acceleration, how do we undo it? Do we over accelerate and then simply say, we want to be in there and we bring gender decolonial. So we bring our agendas, put us in, which I would support wholeheartedly. Do we create parallel organizations? So indigenous decolonial environmental humanities, the people who do sun, the syndemics and Cecilia Asberg, Syl Hartman, they're all environmental humanities people gone rogue i.e. gone into feminism and decolonial, saying now we call ourselves, and here we go again, what do we call ourselves? And terminology, the creativity factor, the, the environmental humanities are in place, they're massive corporations. So we want to remix them, decompartmentalize them, bring in our critical culture, and what do we have? Well, let's call it the critical humanities for the 21st century, but let's do it. <laughs> let's move our programs a little bit in our direction and not close ranks and dismiss all of this as just a social problem. This is not just a social problem. This is a planetary posthuman biopolitical problem and that, that encompasses a far broader range of issues, including the suffering of humans. Um, but as Lynn Margulis says, you know what? Bacteria will survive us. And if Lynn Margulis says it, then it has to be true. So that's a bit um, the discussion there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so questions. much for for crystallizing that um, in, in such a vivacious way. And I, I'm, I know that my, my colleague Till Weingartner also wants to come in. So thank you um, very much for that. Um, Till, over to you. Hello, I think my video is still stopped by the host oh, because sorry. I hadn't, hadn't turned off my camera before. Um, yes, thank you very much for the very, um, Stop my video. So here I am. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. I'm. I think I'm. I have to say I'm even newer to the whole area than all that, and um, I'm still probably now in the process of of collecting some of my thoughts. And um, the question I had, I think there's already overlap with with what you just said in response to Nula and to Order, but I would still maybe like to go go down the route or ask you a little bit more going down that route. It was really. I was really grateful for you reminding us uh, of, of the function maybe of critical theory to challenge us, to push us out of the comfort zone. Um, but also reminding us that this, this, this can be a very joyful enterprise um, and something that will help us to find new ways of um, discoveries and inquiry. And I think um, Nula was kind of talking about our position within the academia. And um, Chiara, at the beginning, I think she mentioned your involvement in setting up programs at the Institute. And of course, you have just a few minutes ago, you have talked about all these new institutes um, outside of the classical humanities. Um, I'm still wondering what you think of saying, you know, all these new structures being set up, if at the end of the day, they are still maybe reproducing or following structures in the academia that have been around for a long time and whether you know setting up institutes setting up centers all of that and saying you know we set up a center that is meant to be transdisciplinary and where we want to collaborate is this um still the only kind of space where we where we can engage on such projects um or is it something that still is somehow restrictive because the moment I set up the center, I probably also have to go and write some kind of narrative for the university management. Um, have to find some narrative where I can say, "Oh, this is this will, this is going to be great to get in funding." 
So what, what are these sort of day-to-day -day restrictions for us question, in folks. academia? Um, but this is precisely the issue of epistemic accelerationism. Uh, when I did uh, my genealogy of the posthumanities in the second volume of the posthuman, uh, I narrated as follows. Um, ever since I've been in academia, around, between, beneath and beyond the classical disciplines of the humanities, which were not called the humanities when I was a student, they were called either human sciences or the arts. Uh, depending on where you were. So um, uh, one of the games that we could play is ask people, what was your faculty called when you uh, graduated? In it? And you will see the shift and the changes coming uh, very rapidly over the last decades. Um, but anyway, uh, classical disciplines and then in between, beneath and beyond the studies areas. I, I was one of the creators, co-creators of women's studies, gender studies. And among the laughs and the contempt and the resistance of the classical disciplines that would just not know what to do with us. Now the gender studies program in Utrecht now has 300 students in the first year. Philosophy has 17, okay. But oh, hey, 17 that are worth pure gold um, according to uh, the standards of patriarchy. Uh, but the, the relationship is just, <coughs> staggering, media studies, hundreds of students, studies, 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 they start in the 60s. What are they? Supplements to the disciplines that remain the humanistic and um, Eurocentric, uh, man-centered, um, uh, all of that? Are they tentacular extensions? Are they symptoms of decline as the conservatives would have it? And what are they? Because these studies are incredibly prolific. And they go on multiplying. Um, and it's not just gender, it's not just the minorities. And uh, it is the voices of the minorities, but as many other things up. Media, how does media start as film and television studies, theater studies already. But film and television, ooh, radical. And then comes media and then new media, and then new media splinters into software. And we have a whole set of things, uh, radical algorithmic studies and um, Snowden studies. Um, race and cell studies, study, 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 what is going on here? I think that's a very serious question. And my sense of it is, um, in that article did in, in uh, TSC, is, is we have a desperate attempt to come to terms with the present. So we, we go back to the present as the record of what we are ceasing to be and the seed of what we are in the process of becoming. So there is an affirmative side to that. And we have negotiations with capital, serious negotiations with capital um, uh, in a way that the classical disciplines somehow don't. There's a certain amount that you can do with history. And I think if I were to take a discipline like history, I would see how media has colonized it. History today is entertainment. We have a television uh, channel called History. It's all about Hitler most of the time, but it is the H channel. Um, uh, the pop, history has become popular entertainment. Um, but apart from that, history remains the bastion of national identity and holds its position in the university as such, in the same way as philosophy is the bastion of universal rationalism, and that's its function in the university. And anthropology is the cookie cutter, can go either way, and literature is in complete decline and is being underfunded and being phased out. That's cutting a very long story short about the crisis of the humanities. So the studies are a supplement to, critically, and a, a creative attempt to reach out, and they continue multiplying. Um, uh, I mean, scholars of the caliber of, 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 of Chiara Bonfiglioli, but I could mention Sandra Ponzanesi, who was at a couple of ERCs, come straight out of gender studies, never re-enter the disciplines really, and continuing moving forward. Sandra Ponzanesi ERC is about crossing over gender studies with post-colonial studies with the digital humanities. ERC, millions, okay? But look at what she's doing, okay? Step by step by step. And now occasionally you turn back and the disciplines are like the gates of the cities, a couple of kilometers back and you go by literature, which is where Sandra happens to come from. So where are we here? So you can have a negative reading of this and say crisis of the humanities, which I don't because I hate uh, any discourse of the crisis. Um, or you can say here we have a different model of the university already implemented, already functioning, which we need to actually come to terms with. Here we go again, trust the present, radical empiricism. Let's do a cartography. And I'm working together with Sarah Nuttall 
and I still remember on this and the because it's, it's connected for us with decolonizing the curriculum and the term that we have adopted is the distributed university, a university distributed across uh, cognitive capitalism, which is a, a, a knowledge producing uh, market economy where where knowledge is real cash <laughs> is serious capital and vice versa um, uh, activism black lives matters feminism the critical traditions because the old world is falling so we need to bring in our visions and speed energy the feeling that you're part of the world and you're not locked up in a place where you're going crazy because it has what you're learning has no relationship to how you live so I think I would go with the distributed university model, but these are serious discussions. Um, and the basic point is that I don't think that critical theory people are being invited to the table where these discussions are taking place. And the work that I'm doing with my colleagues for the Volkswagen Foundation is we have volunteered to bring our voices. I can't say that, you know, they're all very enthusiastic, but we are bringing this information. There is a conference in Lisbon in May, May 5 to 7 this year, where we are going out with the New Humanities Network saying, cuckoo, we're here. It's a UNESCO conference about the humanities in Europe today. And we will have Damasio, we've chosen them well. <laughs> we have uh, Marina Warner, we have Rauna Kuokanen, uh, Indigenous Studies Lapland as the main speaker. So it, um, you know, I'm, I'm co-directing the conference. So we are going in certain directions with it, but also massive presence of the discipline say, man needs to be saved, humanism needs to be respected. And I'm perfectly fine with this, so long as I'm, you know, I can say yes and next to it, we will do what the university has done for the last 50 years, the studies, um, the, the, the little slums, uh, the, the little minoritarian knowledges, because that's, I think, where the energy is. So royal science, minor science, if you want to do this with the Deleuze, multiple speeds, but basically a lot of energy. There is no crisis. Um, there's political opposition, that's different. <laughs> The boss, the chair is back, so I have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Rosie, on this related uh, on this related issue of the discipline, there is a question from an early career researcher, which I think it's important. I, have the chat, I see it. Yeah. And she says, uh, "How can an early career researcher in the humanities with a relational unusual career path convince departments and funding bodies to provide them with opportunities such as jobs and funding for more experimental, transdisciplinary, and multidirectional work?" And I think that's something that would resonate with many of our uh, PhD but students. But it should also resonate with you and anybody who has the, taken the risk of not going through the beaten path. So this is a complicated question. Um, uh, my experience of people, early researchers who have uh, tried to uh, break the mold is actually quite positive. Um, um, I don't see the institutions as our enemies. Um, I don't share that vision that uh, critical thinkers are in the universities as the enemies within. I'm, I'm not uh, with that line. We're very much part of this. We are paid by taxpayers to do our job and we better do it well uh, in a critical spirit, but also creative and constructive. Uh, I see antiquated mechanisms at work, but they need to be modernized. And that's what we have younger researchers for. Moreover, cognitive capitalism is on our side. Uh, if you work for uh, the Google campus or the Apple campus or uh, for any of the new interdisciplinary modes of alternative knowledge production, as I call them, they are completely um, multi uh, directional and transdisciplinary and um, uh, they, they would welcome um, I have you know people working a bit in, in doing it I think the Google Labs and um, uh, uh, the people from Skype that, that uh, um, fund the Cambridge Center for the study of um, existential risk that are really assessing the risk of the high tech you see the corporate world really interested in new ideas Cognitive capitalism loves knowledge, makes money out of knowledge. And, and here again, disagreement with more old fashioned Marxist reading of capitalism. Capitalism can be a great ally. And um, Margaret Schildrich and Lina Nika, Nina Licke working on the medical have ample data of how the, 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 the whole hormones discussion and uh, production and consumption of hormones and um, so important for the whole medical field, but also for trans uh, um, feminism uh, and, and classical um, uh, 
uh, sort of hormonal reproductive feminism, how kind of open they are to experimentation. I think that you need to trust, and the example again would be people like Ponsanese who really took enormous risks. And, and because you are bringing solution to problems, you can be, um, uh, in, you know, if, 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 if this, this conditions, um, uh, you can be welcome. There are options there more complicated in my experience, the national levels of um, funding. Um, whether it is the National Research Council, the national academies, the national level has different uh, modes of response. Uh, and I think here the, the more cosmopolitan uh, nature, I think, uh, of corporate um, uh, capitalism clashes with the methodological nationalism of so many grants commissions. And there it's tougher. Um, there, the, certainly the posthumanists don't get passed. Um, uh, it's very easy to, to confuse the posthuman as anti-human, which is a ridiculous simplification, but it happens. Um, uh, when I say, you know, the posthumans were invented uh, by Silicon Valley when they started uh, altering the human and enhancing the human. We didn't invent the posthuman, they did. Now, ours is a critique of what they are doing with the human enhancement programs. Um, but I noticed that, that, that this that doesn't work out well at the level. So there you need to go to the grinds. But let me put it, I think it's Yerin, Yeres. Um, um, let me put it in these terms. Um, what is your project? What is it that you want to do with the capital of intelligence and the intensity of criticism that makes you who you are? And is the university the place where you can do that? Um, are you aware of the extent to which what we knew, knew as the university um, is really one of the branches of cognitive capitalism? Um, it is corporate and um, uh, it, it is quantified. It is under incredible pressure to survive. Populists of all labels hate the university and if they could shut it down and replace it with private uh, funds, they would do so. Um, so if the university is where you want to be, what is your vision of and for that institution? And what are you also prepared to do to help the institution to make it into the 21st century? Because you may be asking the university to do something that right now it is in no position to do because it is very, very much under attack. And I think you will know from uh, more senior staff that we spend a great deal of our time defending what we do, defending 101, the existence of public education in university structures. So ask yourself what exactly is the project? Um, and if it is in a sense in transdisciplinary critical theory, uh, do you think that that can be done within the university today? Um, uh, I think it's, it's something that would require a discussion. I, I don't see much of that, certainly not in my part of the world. Um, and I would go elsewhere probably um, for critical theory, for instance, art institute, public institutes, and corporate, and um, strangely enough, um, uh, NGOs, UN, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but the question of institutions is crucial. Um, hang in there. Yeah, so I think Lawrence has a question that he wants to ask. Uh, We're just getting some uh, raised hand from the public. So thank you so much for answering Yaren's uh, question, Rosie. It was very complex one. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Lawrence. Wonderful, thank you. Um, well, first, I just wanted to thank Rosie for the wonderfully rich presentation. Um, I have a question about the um, temporalities of your work and specifically the utopian temporalities of your work. So at the start of this afternoon's presentation, um, you indicated that um, you know, what the, uh, the post-human focuses on is um, where we are at rather than a utopian horizon. And then you closed this afternoon's presentation by invoking our irrepressible, inexhaustible capacity to think the future. And then in the question and answer period, um, you emphasize the importance of trust in the present um, and in the experience of marginality that one shares with others 
And in response to one of the questions, you were critical of the backward looking focus of many academic disciplines in the university. And so I suppose my question is specifically to seek some clarification about the temporal suppositions of your work and specifically, and this really intrigues me from your presentation, the utopian temporalities, because you invoked in the Q&A period in particular, the work of Lynn Siegel on happiness, where she deals with uh, the utopian tradition uh, in that, uh, in, in two of the chapters of that book, you, you mentioned the work, the utopian, feminist utopian work of Octavia Butler, uh, other feminist utopias. And I'm thinking specifically of a particular utopian tradition which invokes the unfulfilled possibilities of the past in, 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 in uh, support of a transformed future. People like William Morris, Austin Tappan Wright, Ursula Le Guin, um, uh, Gora Descher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just like you to, I know you said if you were on a desert island, you would only take philosophy texts and not <laughs> literature, no, no, and not works of literature. But I'm just, I wonder your, to hear your thoughts about the contribution that these sort of, yeah. in particular feminist utopian works with a, a, a romantic element that look backwards to look future, to look mm -hmm. forward, um, might make to the sort of affirmative thinking the hope, the without shallow optimism that you've invoked? What a great question. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I consume a lot of literature. Um, uh, I, I'm a double major, philosophy literature, not philosophy law. There are two types of philosophers, those who did philosophy law and those who did philosophy literature, two worlds apart. Um, that's me. Thank you so much. Complicated, but spot on. Um, two level of discussion. First is non-linear temporalities, I completely agree. Uh, that's uh, rhizomic thinking, nomadic thinking, a little bit all over the place, but in the sense of holding on to the complexity of the time frame, the present as the record of what we are ceasing to be, not, not dead, but ceasing to, and this is what we're in the process of becoming, all process ontologies and all process thinking, which is already complex because how do you account uh, for um, a process um, uh, in, in the language um, of humanity scholarship? So absolutely there. A utopian, I don't use that term, I know where you're going with it, I prefer to call it the speculative, creative role of the imagination in this entire definition of critical uh, theory. Um, the imagination is the factor here, and you do know what a role it plays in Spinoza in terms of both a dangerous faculty out of control, but also necessary, because it is what allows you to make the connection, the associations, the slippages almost. Um, think of the work of Tony Negri on, on the imagination in Savage Anomaly, one of the greatest books on Spinoza in the second half of the 20th century that was published with a preface by Deleuze, which irritated Foucault enormously because uh, Negri was in trouble with the law at that time. Uh, imagination, absolutely central. I would translate your utopian level with a speculative role of the imagination, fundamental, because with that speculative elements, you get a navigational tool that cuts across time on a diagonal line and allows you to do what is crucial for the affirmative ethics project, that is to say, anticipate. These are anticipatory projections. And um, Ursula Le Guin saw, you know, the polysex trans world of today coming, you know, decades before. Um, uh, it, it is like insights that are um, outside the linearity of time. And I think that's the absolute role certainly of literature because medium of language is what it used, but of the arts um, in general. I would say that most people's uh, perception, apprehension of the posthuman convergence today would be mediated by some sort of movie, cinema, video games, <coughs> some sort of gaming would be crucial to this, uh, mediated completely by, by an imaginary 
um, that would not be conceptual, that would be totally um, uh, visual and mediated. So anticipatory project projection, uh, crucial here, um, and they cut both ways. So let me come to the other crucial point of your, of your um, question. When I talk about the virtual possibilities, it is not, this virtuality is not postulated on a linear scale that would necessarily uh, locate the virtual in the future. E even worse, I think that this linearity with the virtual in the future is what transhumanism does. And Nick Bostrom and the big transhumanist in Oxford, exactly like their fellows in Silicon Valley are saying, we go through this moment of transformation of the human and then at a later point, we will become posthuman. Well, not really, <laughs> not really. I see the posthuman convergence operating right now uh, at this particular moment. And what may happen in the future um, uh, is a, a question mark. In other words, the transhumanist by having a utopian future maintain the linearity of time and with it, the transhumanists maintain humanism. Nick Bostrom is a, an absolute humanist and he believes the human enhancement is the way to fulfill the project of the enlightenment. Then we will have the perfectibility of humans through science and, and, and technology on a lovely linear frame. And then we will become posthuman. This is almost the opposite of what critical posthumanists are saying. The virtual, what we're capable of becoming can look in multiple directions. And Deleuze talks about the virtual past as ideas, thoughts, intuitions, in some cases, entire corpuses of, of work, think of Spinoza, who somehow go quiet. They are not deleted and they are not excluded. They just go dormant. The model here would be the Leibnizian philosophy of perspectivism. When Leibniz talks about multiple windows on reality and they have different degrees of intensity and some just, you know, quieten down uh, and then all of a sudden reemerge um, uh, viruses. Um, uh, it, it, the virtual just goes sort of beneath and then bides its time. And, and the task of critical theory is to fish out some of these ideas and reactivate them, actualize them, instantiate them, and activate them in the present. Um, I think radical democracy is a great idea. We should bring it back. Um, um, I think uh, anticipating a post-COVID world that would be technologically mediated and yet full of solidarity and awareness of colonialism, of racism, of, 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 of uh, uh, sexism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, and all of that. Um, you may say dreaming, yeah, let's, if enough of us dream, we have a collective hallucination to quote William Gibson and we have a script for the future. So it's not in the linear model, it can absolutely be the inexhaustible possibilities of the past. And this is why I do defend the classical humanities. I think we should read a lot. I think all students, if they want to do the humanities need to do a hundred books a year and consume the arts. I'm a great believer in all of that. Uh, you want to be critical theory? Read, 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 and read some more <laughs> because the data that we are digging up is mostly from the past. And it assumes that a lot of these traditions have just gone too quiet for our own good we need to bring them. So data mine within the tradition back to the future. I use various terminologies to um, make the, all of our researchers find back traces of minor knowledges uh, within the traditions and um, beneath and beyond the canonical texts there are masses of other texts that have not quite made it. So in that sense, um, I would uh, try to answer anticipations, projections, and inexhaustible pos possibilities, but not on a linear temporal frame. Difficult question. I don't know if I did justice to it. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. This uh, virtuality uh, and potentiality question brings me back to the times in Paris studying with Daniel Ben Said when he was teaching us Walter Benjamin and Auguste Blanqui, and you might know that Blanqui, he wrote this interesting text called L'Eternité par les Astres, in which he was, he was 
thinking how, what would have happened in another planet if uh, the revolutionaries would have won the revolution. So he was kind of thinking of himself in another planet after having won the revolution, which was like... It's the gestures of transposition that, that liberates you from the burden of the present so you can dream. Now, that's, in, that's a role for the humanities. Um, and it's not irresponsible. It's a gesture of incredible love for the world that you can do that that you can actually shake it off and say, I'm giving you the answer. It would be like, it would be uh, like this. It, it's it takes, talk about energy, um, the love, the, uh, the inspiration that you need to have to do that. And, and our culture is full of examples like this. Um, Diary of Anne Frank, uh, a classic for all times. What does it take to, to be that type of human? Behind this is, is the vital materialism minus the organic fascistic elements um, uh, that what humans are and what all living entities are, are energy machines that aim to persevere in their existence, like Spinoza 101. We are entities whose joy and, and pleasure consist in persevering in being. Um, uh, that's, that's, our, that's as simple as that, i.e. immensely complicated, um, because all of that is fraught, of course, with power relations. So there is that, that and people dismiss this, particularly Hegelians dismiss this as silly, naivete, but it in fact is deeply stoical, radical immanence. I am part of this life in this planet in this particular moment. And my responsibility is to take accountability for the multiple ecologies of belonging and inject um, affirmation uh, into it. It's, it's, it's that type of, of gesture. I'm repeating myself. <laughs> well, that's great. And maybe I'll ask the other panelists uh... To, uh, to come back uh, with their video. Uh, you get some compliments in the audience by the co-chair of the Board of Women's Studies. Ah, I see Roshin there. Uh, Roshin, would you maybe want to ask something? I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm conscious that you have a lecture with our students in, in 15 minutes, so up to you. Okay. <laughs> you the name Roshin, what a wonderful name. <laughs> Thanks, sir. I think it's a, Rosie it Rosie. translated to Rosie, so maybe we've got... <laughs> My name is Rosina, so yes, as yes. Chiara now, so ah, it's almost the same. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, I feel like I've had a, quite a web of, of journeys there through through this afternoon and yeah I don't know what we'll talk about now in, in 50 minutes with, with class after this. Um, I'm in the theatre department um, here at UCC and I'm struck um, with the need to defend theatre is, is in, in solidarity with what you're talking about in terms of defence, in terms of pressures. And when I was uh, a, a student, there wasn't such a department anywhere in the country. Like the, they're there now, but the arts were, even, you know, weren't even within the walls. I mean, actually, we're not technically within the walls, still we're <laughs> very much outside of them. Um, but that place of those kinds of thinking, and this is really more a response in a way, um, that that yes dreaming yes building worlds but what the theater reminds us of is we they they fall down and we do them again yeah. and again and again and again the next night and i think that's really crucial because mm -hmm. uh, i was thinking back to the beginning of your of your talk about affect being very central there but every time that comes up for me now i'm haunted by the guys um storming the the Capitol building um, in mm -hmm. january and how affectively mm -hmm. enthralled they were and how affect um, troubles, you know, like can can consolidate um, these extreme, very non-thinking kind of ways of, you know, of belonging. I mean, they had an extreme sense of belonging oh, yeah. and entitlement out of that. So how can we mobilize those affective structures and think through them in ways that ask us to do it again and again? Like the Bikesha and I can't go on, I'll go on. It keeps haunting me as well, even though... <laughs> I really want not want, don't want to be on that roadside, um, always waiting for something. Um, but that non-doing and undoing and unbecoming um, are essential to the processes of presence um, in theatre training. Um, alongside, uh, you know, trying like I really I, I feel the struggle of the use of affirmation because of the ways in which you know you call it the silly optimism. So it's like trying to think. Um, through bodies um, in their undoing and unbecoming mm -hmm. and their degenerativeness, um, which, you know, I suppose theatre can, can plays a role in promoting in ways that are playful and disruptive, but also in community um, and in repetition. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. In, in, the, in my cartographies, 
a theater study is soon to become performance studies huh? because yes, it, it, yes. there's also an acceleration yeah. there and then what comes after performance studies would be uh, the question uh, to look at the rise of that and then the rise of the digital and to look at the uh, the rematerialization of bodies in theater and performance studies with that dematerialization in the media and digital i mean the whole gaming thing um, uh, which gets capital goes there because God, how much money? I mean, sometimes people give me the the the, the figures of, of you know this Game of Thrones, the game, not not the series, which was bad enough. The game is it is beyond the imagination uh, for, for us theater going uh, people. So there there are hierarchies here. There, there are choices mm -hmm. being made in terms of where the real bodies are, as opposed to where they're being dematerialized or rather dematerialize as data and then re-emerging as data because data is also material but there is a process here whereby real bodies evaporate so to speak um, um incredibly interesting and to look at the potential of the, the theater and performance i remember pina bausch way back in the 80s pina bausch is extraordinary if you look at it again today you think what uh, it's, it's like it's molecular it's viral she has the interrelationality insightful i mean she's almost a time machine way ahead of the time. So why is this kind of uh, underfunded, underwritten, um, marginalized? Um, uh, is it because there's real body in real spaces is something else? I think this would be one of the critical humanities studies. Um, in the surveys that we've just done with the Volkswagen Foundation, it didn't, it didn't come across as a strong field at all. It's, it's suffering uh, from gaming, it seems to me, from new media. New media is the, the big boy um, uh, in, in the field. So definitely worth doing and bringing back. It's one of those virtual, virtual paths that I would say, what does it look like now um, that bodies are returning massively on a planetary scale as corpses, guess what? Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the, the ultimate form of rematerialization. And, and if we have to train collectively people to mourn the losses on a planetary scale with, with both solidarity and some sort of empathy or some sort of sympathy, uh, the classical function of theater as, as a training in collectivizing the affects. Uh, talk about going back to the future. Uh, uh, it would be almost one on one. Um, uh, sometimes uh, you see indeed public events and you think this is, this, is a, uh, this is a performance. I mean, what's happening with the royal family is a performance. It's completely Shakespeare, like uh, the, the shadow of Lady Diana casting. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like Shakespearean. Um, uh, so many of the scripts are investing our collective imaginary. The, the bottom line would be how do we affect the social imaginary um, and, and how do we train people uh, to relate otherwise? I think a huge role for the performance and people are also doing it through carnivals, festivals, um, you know, puppet shows. There is kind of a, a return of the basic artisanal kind of arts and crafts of performances. And um, there's a need for uh, rematerializing and relocalizing the practices. I would really go for it. A um, uh, big European project, you know, relaunch the role of this as a, tr as a training for uh, kind of a posthuman ethical um, truth and reconciliation commission with the viruses, because this is not the last one that we're getting. On affect in the media and the January 6th riots, I think the bottom line here is the extent to which a certain type of media has colonized a certain type of social imaginary. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the niche kind of television station, Fox, which I never watched, of course, and you never watched, but the people of January 6th uh, raised in it. Um, uh, there is a, a recoding of the social imaginary through certain media outlets. Mm -hmm. um, and here the compartmentalization of Facebook and, and that, that you only watch the things that you already know that you agree with has done enormous damage. And um, the whole point of theater and, and in fact cultural uh, training was be exposed to diversity, encounter the unknown, um, uh, experience things that you haven't lived through yet, get a life, really very much get a life. Um, and now we have the opposite, a recolonization of the imaginary uh, and the conservatives call this a tribal epistemology. That you, you go by tribe. I get the information of my tribe and I don't look at anything else. And I think populism here is really uh, absolutely um, perfecting uh, this type of specialized ignorance. I only know my thing and I don't look around um, uh, um, uh, to anything else. This is almost the opposite of what I have in mind with an affect 
model, there would be relational and affirmative. Um, because what relational and affirmative does is deprovincializes the mind. It says, get out of the comfort zone and get a life and talk um, and relate, take in otherness, um, take in uh, the, the, the world as an uncomfortable feeling, as a feeling of non-recognition, as a feeling of loss of dispossession, um, uh, decolonizing the imagination. I think post-colonial theory, even before the decolonial moment, did incredible work on this, race theory, feminism also, de kind of detox yourself uh, from the permanence of certain images. Um, uh, the work of psychoanalytic feminism on this is also something we've left behind too quickly. It's the fault of Deleuze and the Deleuzeans. That they, they think that uh, if you do Deleuze, you're against psychoanalysis. Deleuze is only possible because there was psychoanalysis. Um, Guattari was Lacan's favorite student. Um, they, they assume the existence of psychoanalytic ethics and they go one further by exchanging uh, Spinoza against Hegel and introducing a different logistical system. Uh, but it assumes uh, something about an imaginary that is culturally coded, but completely animates our perception of the world. Today, everything is mediated. One of my favorite texts in trans feminism is um, Jack Halberstam, Gaga feminism. You know, you, you perceive feminism through Beyonce and Gaga. Of course you do. And we did it for Simone de Beauvoir. Well, other times, <laughs> there was a different moment uh, in media history. Now, if you can get it through Lady Gaga, you're doing good. Beyonce, go for it. A perfect definition of feminism. Limited, but hey, um, it's a definition that we can live by. So the media effort can be very liberating if we have an ethics whereby the message is get out of your little hole, now de detoxify yourself, get a life, get out a bit more, encounter otherness. And that's absolutely a job for the university, specifically for the humanities. That's what we do, not only with the decolonial, but also the de falicize no, de eurocentrize <laughs> uh, de anthropocentrize just, just displace and become part of the world. So th that would be an answer there, but definitely an alternative performances to actually do something with the imaginary that would move it out of humanism and anthropocentrism. After all, if you do it even with basic psychoanalytic theory, the inhuman is already there. I mean, the inhuman is one of the elements of psychoanalysis and the animal in us, the animal elements of our, of our embodiment, um, uh, the, the non-human elements of our memory, uh, all the unconscious is, is a transgenerational, trans-species memory. We remember things that never happened to us. Now, how can that be? Well, welcome to being a complex human. Uh, we, we carry the, the memories of previous generations. We carry the memories of previous species. It's called the genetic code. Yeah, well, it's your body, buddy. Um, so I think it, it, it talk about temporalities. Uh, there's a lot that we could learn about how to construct a different imaginary. So yes, posthuman performance studies. I think it exists, actually. I think we have um, uh, in our, uh, Michael Blaker in our university and other people doing performing the posthuman um, as a way of opening up our self-representation. Um, totally exciting. Thank you. In a great field, lucky you. Beats philosophy anyway. <laughs> Sorry guys, but hey. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosie. Uh, I'm conscious of time and that uh, some of you have other commitments and lectures. I have a little one coming back from the crash. Waiting. Forget commitments. This is GNP time. I feel totally oppressed not to be able to share that with you. <laughs> It's a pity we cannot go to the pub together ah. after this because it would have really been nice Maybe another sunny, time. Day, oh, a sunny day in Cork, at least uh, for the next half hour. So uh, thank you so much, Rosie. Thank you all. Brilliant. Uh, and I'm sure my colleagues uh, think the same. So thank you, Sammy. Stay well. Thank you stay so healthy. much, Rosie. Love to your daughter, Kiara. Send pictures and uh, right. keep well. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, thank you so much. Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs>